when, when uh, you know, it takes a while for the um, video to resolve. Originally, uh, when I picked up that slide, it looked horrible. <laughs> you know, it looked like just instead of a, um, uh, you know, like a canvas that was just colored instead of okay. individual stars. So it was kind of good. It's been up there for a while. <laughs> <coughs> I don't see her. Yeah. Maybe you're. All right. So let's get started. It is 10 o'clock. Yep. Okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to Singapore and welcome to the HC Working Group. So, if you haven't read that, please note well. Uh, okay, so blue sheets, uh, they are circulating somewhere. Uh, please make sure uh, that you sign them up. Uh, we need Jabber scribes. So, any volunteers? Hello, people, wake up. Okay, so I will try to do it, but yeah. Uh, also, there's uh, Etherpad. It's helpful uh, if you help uh, write the minutes. It's like collaborative effort. So uh, this is the DHC working group. Uh, so there are two chairs. Uh, this is Bernie Voss and uh, I'm Tom Kongranski. Hello. Uh, Okay, so what we have on the agenda today, uh, administrivia, this is the thing uh, I'm going to right now. Uh, after that, uh, we're going with the uh, problem statement of uh, multi recurrent extensions for uh, DHPv6. Uh, after that, uh, we have two presentations from Ian. Please be gentle on him. Uh, so he's in Europe and it's like 3 a.m. for him. So <clears throat> he assured us that his coffee is strong and good, but. You never know. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, we have uh, the last uh, topic. Uh, oh, uh, sorry, the, the the second topic that uh, Ian will be uh, talking about is uh, uh, prefix delegating relay. So, so this is a new material. Uh, and finally, uh, we have a discussion about uh, advancing DHCP to to full standards. So, uh, team will be running the show. Okay, so uh, what's the document status? Uh, we have uh, several. Uh, the number of drafts is decreasing, which is good, uh, but still uh, there, there are some uh, some uh, new appearances. So the first one, uh, Vincent Yang. So this is something that's on agenda today. Uh, Mark a sign. Uh, it's still going through the last call. Uh, Bernie and I will. Uh, uh, talk about uh, wrapping this up uh, in a couple of days but there is still time to uh, to share your comments so if if you have some time please read it uh, it's it's a short draft i mean it's like 12 or 14 pages uh, so the next one <coughs> a problem statement of mre uh, this is on a, a on agenda uh, the next draft uh, did see slap quadrant this is something that's uh, also in last call. So again, please share your comments. Uh, and uh, finally, the, the last uh, uh, related draft. So this is still individual. Uh, uh, the prefix delegating relay, uh, it's on the agenda. And I think that that's it regarding Cadmus Trivia. So uh, let's go with the... Seems 
Here, you can, you should be able to advance. Let me see if you, yeah, for some reason it doesn't like to do it sometimes. Okay, now it's working, isn't it? Yeah, it's not doing it in the, uh, there we go. Okay, now it should be okay. <clears throat> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Lin He from Tsinghua University. Today, I'm going to talk about the update on problem statement of multi requirements extensions for DHCP v6. Uh, first, let's have a quick recap of this document. Uh, we introduced multi requirements extensions for DHCP v6 in IETF 98 in Chicago for the first time. And in the ITF 104 in uh, Prague, we presented this work and the community considered it valuable. And Bernie Tommy and some other people uh, on the mailing list gave, gave valuable requirement, uh, comments on this document. And we updated, uh, updated the two versions to solve the open issues before IETF 106. Um, the main changes since IETF 104 uh, include uh, in figure one, the, gen uh, the general DHCP model, we modify the message processing functions into message pro uh, relaying functions for DHCP relays. And we modified uh, DHCP general model uh, by adding ex external entities and inputs. And in section 4.2.4, uh, we uh, in the previous version we say we said D uh, DHCP v6 servers try to generate random uh, addresses, but the, the, in, in this version we current we say currently the DHCP uh, servers assign addresses prefix and uh, some some other uh, configuration options uh, to their uh, to their configured policies, and re we remove the section section four point. 2.5 extension principles and explain its uh, its content in the introduction. And we talked about enforcing local policies uh, as use cases using more general languages in section five. Uh, this is the original DHCP general model and which includes a message, uh, DHCP messages options and the message processing functions and address generation mechanisms and we modify it in the new version. And this is a modified DHCP general model. Um, we add uh, external inputs and entities uh, in this version and to make it more general and clearer. And uh, for DHCP, uh, for message extension, we can not only uh, define new DHCP messages to uh, enrich its functionalities, but also we can uh, extend the, the new messages to enhance its security. For option extension, we can, uh, DHCP v6 allows define new, uh, new, new options to uh, transmit parameters between um, DHCP entities. And also we can define, uh, define new Option, uh, also the options can make can, may come from uh, may come from external inputs. For example, uh, RFC 7037 defines uh, defines the radius options to to exchange uh, authorization and identification information between DHCP relay and the DHCP server. Um, next stop, next steps, and we believe this draft is ready for working group last call, and the open issues are relatively minor. And thanks for listening. Any questions, comments, or concerns? So, just as a reminder, this is an informational document. Tracking. Yeah, yeah, this is an informational document. <clears throat> Thank you.
Yeah, Suresh Krishnan. So I, I read the draft. It looks like more like a survey than a problem statement. Like what what did he mean by problem statement? Um, well, uh, we we start, uh, as IP, IP addresses is closely to the uh, manageability, uh, privacy protection, service, uh, uh, security, and traceability of the networks. And we summarize the uh, possible extension points of DHCPv6 to uh, to present uh, an overview of the the extensions right like and that's why it's it's looked more like a survey of like you know existing mechanisms and like specific implementations than a problem statement for something so i think the name is like a bit misleading uh ah uh, yeah so it's uh, bernie vols it's a good point uh suresh i think originally the problem was you know they wanted a, a way to generate addresses with semantics in them right and and maybe I'll have to go back. Maybe some of that got lost, okay. and 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 so it it's a question about do we, you know, do we add that back in if it's not clear, or should we just change the title to make it more of a survey? Yeah, I, I think like a change the title is like a better thing because I couldn't really see a specific problem statement anywhere in the draft. So yeah. uh, so and I, I think you know it is a general mechanism, so it it probably would be better to to just make it a. You know, here's a survey of mechanisms that exist or something. Sounds good. Thanks. Thank you. Any other comments? Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see if I can do a better job at this time. Okay, so the next one is uh, Deep Three Things, Ian. So, Ian, uh, now it's your turn. I think you have to hit the red button yeah. if he's in the queue. I don't know how that works. Let's see. Ian, are you out there? We're not hearing you. We see you. Anyway, what about now? Oh, yes. There we go. Excellent. OK. So uh, that's working OK, is it? Yes. Yes. Good. OK. Uh, good morning. So um, I've got a couple of things for you. Uh, first one is an update to the Yang DHCP6 data model draft mm -hmm. that we've had kicking around for just probably coming into its fourth year now, actually. Um, can you move on to the first, uh, the next slide, please? So, um, I think the last time this was presented was back in uh, at IETF 104. Um, and the message then was that it was kind of languishing a little bit due to a lot of the existing co-authors having moved on to other things and, uh, um, and also the general size of the task that we were trying to tackle. Um, I'm pleased to announce that this is no longer the case. So um, Michael from ISC joined us uh, after the, the call for new author, authors at uh, IETF 104. And uh, I think we've got the thing very much back on the rails as a result of that. Um, I wouldn't call it quite a ground up rewrite that we've got, but pretty much all of the content in there is new. I mean, we've reevaluated all of the model structures, <laughs> the scope that's in there, um, a lot of moving out of unnecessary parts and uh, a lot of refocusing really on just you know what are the important things of building a um an extensible set of models and coming up with guidelines and rules for how those uh, the extensions can be done um so that we can leave for subsequent work uh, any you know adding new functionality and things um, and and modeling the rest of the protocol uh, depending on what people find to be relevant and uh, you know are willing to put the effort into doing um can we go on to the next slide so what i propose and what we ended up doing was basically refocusing on just getting a, a decent model that covers what's in 8415 
um, the boil the ocean problem of uh, that we we originally set ourselves, and I think we really dramatically underestimated what was going to be possible uh, of trying to model kind of the the state of the art of the protocol. Um, yeah, the, the resulting work was just was just too huge. Um, refocusing on eighty four fifteen has given us something which is much much easier to work with. Uh, and I think they're much, much easier to read and, uh, and hopefully for people to review as well. Um, we've also managed to do this in a way that I, I don't think we've ended up with too much um, duplication of functionality and duplication in the models as well. So we've got quite a good reuse mechanism, which I'll, I'll come on to on later slides. Uh, can we go on to the next one, please? So um, strangely enough, we kind of overlooked how this model uh, or the, the models would interface and, and um, interwork with other existing Yang models and, uh, you know, particularly around IETF uh, interfaces, sorry. Um, I don't know quite how we managed to do that, but there we are. Um, so we've restructured this to use the existing interfaces tree that IETF in, uh, interfaces provides us with. Um, and then we take this and add in the functionality that we need on top of the already existing uh, interface refs that that provides. Um, what this then means is that for every interface that you wish to uh, provide configuration for, it kind of gives you a, uh, a structure in which that can all be built and, and um, you know, it makes it for much better into working what's, with what's already there. Uh, and I think it makes just a lot more sense as well. Um, we'd also overlooked any data about uh, any state data and timer data, uh, which again seems to be a fairly glaring omission now that I came back and looked at it. So that's fixed as well. Um, we removed a lot of the stuff that was done in, in features in the past, but one thing that we have less, left, and I think the only existing remaining feature actually is for prefix delegation, because obviously not every client has that. Um, and we've also gone back and, uh, and cleaned up a lot of the not notification stuff that uh, wasn't really working either. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the server has probably had more reworking than anything else because that one was, was really starting to spiral out of control in the, the size of what um, uh, the model and the amount that we were trying to do in there. Um, so a lot of the things that we've decided to, that were really implementation specific, we've now just shifted out of the server model. Um, because really there's no realistic way that you can try and cover things that are going to please every implementation in there. So, you know, the, the best solution there was just not to try. Um, we also think a lot of the value of, of having a common model here is around um, and, and where a lot of your investment in, in um, building network wide configurations and uh, you know, the time that goes into that is actually around client configuration or lease configuration pools the network objects and you know the other things around that um and so we kind of said well if if that stuff can be built and that can be transferable um between different implementations then that's that's a much higher value than saying it we want a model that is also transferable for uh implementation specific functionality as well so i think we um you know that, that's how we decided to structure it but i'll, I'll show I'll talk about that a little bit further in a second um yeah, so anything around things like database backends, um, interface configuration, we shifted this out. This now exists in the appendix uh, and it gets in, uh, augmented into a particular container which is provided for exactly this purpose uh, as it's necessary. Next slide, please. Um, the same thing, uh, thought process went behind the client class selections uh, process as well. Um, so. Michael did some digging into, I forget how many implementations it was, but it was probably about five or something he, he looked into and found that whilst the way that we classify incoming messages so that we can give them the right options, the right select addresses from the right pools and things, this is a common problem that needs to be solved. Um, there's a lot of variance in how this is configured. This is how, how it's described and, and also um, Kind of the, the idea behind how it's structured. Uh, so once again, we thought that um, the best thing to do here was just to take that functionality out of the main model and provide a uh, example set of this, which we moved into an appendix um, and show how this would interwork and show how you could, you know, take either the model that we have there or you know use this as a basis for building your own. 
Uh, next slide, please. Um, another thing that really was spiraling out of control in the original model that we had, or the, uh, the version 8 model, was the modeling of DHCP options. I mean, I think we're up to about 130, 140 now, or something like that, with, with a few emissions in there. Um, and originally, we'd, we'd taken this, this idea of saying, well, we can, you know, the, from a modeling perspective, the, uh, the structure of a DHCP option makes it fairly trivial, although somewhat labor intensive, to, uh, to model these things. So we tried to do this. We tried to model every option that was out there. We then tied ourselves in a different knot of saying, well, how do you deal with variants of implementations? How do you deal with the fact that some options are only relevant for clients, some are relevant for relays, some are relevant for survey, servers, uh, or, or pretty much any permutation of, uh, of those as well? Um, and we ended up with a, a rather nasty set of features and things that, you know, it, it just, the, the more the options went in there, the, the uglier the whole thing got. Um, it was also going to make it very difficult to maintain. And, uh, you know, every time a new option gets uh, ratified, then we end up with an out of date model. So we kind of went back to that and have cut the scope of those options down to just the relevant ones which exist in 8415. Um, we use an identity mechanism to define what, uh, whether we're dealing with a client, a server, or a relay, and then we augment the options um, based on what that identity is as, uh, as is relevant. Um, what this also, actually, if you move on to the next slide, uh, what this also does is provides us with an easy way of making it extensible. So the format that we define in the 8415 set of options um, we also can do for really as many as, as necessary and then the idea being that a device which implements those particular options can uh, would obviously implement the yang model that would uh, support those options to define the configuration of those options and so those can be loaded accordingly um, and then we get ourselves out of the feature mess uh, so again we've gone down the, the uh, line of providing an example of this, uh, we used RFC 3319 because it's the first numeric set of options that don't exist in 8415. Uh, and they're also nice and simple as well. So it was a, a, a good candidate for, um, uh, for an example. Um, so we provide this Yang module in there and we show how that can be augmented into place. Um, there's also nine or 10 guidelines that are in there, which, uh, which describe how we're doing the naming conventions, uh, how well, a bunch of different other things that would uh, hopefully make it pretty easy for people uh, in the future to follow the same kind of format and, and come up with a set of, uh, you know, a, a Yang module that will work within this mechanism and would be consistent with everything else that's going on there as well. Um, so this was something we talked about previously, but is actually, uh, yeah, we, we put into this version as well. Um, and I think the last slide, 30 minutes for this seems a little bit ambitious. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we think we've now got everything that's in 8415, uh, which is kind of what we set ourselves the scope to do. Um, one thing that I would be interested in here is, um, from anyone who, who reviews or anyone who's had, had a look at this, um, is the scope enough now? I mean, you know, we've pared it down so significantly. Have we gone too far? Um, and, you know, if so, what are the, the essential things that would need to go into here to give us you know, this framework and a, a, a basically fun, fundamental set of uh, models that can be used uh, with a good, you know, a good way of being able to give uh, uh, extensibility as necessary in the future. So I, I'd be very interested in hearing about that. Um, the amount of work that's gone into this has been, because there's been so much kind of re restructuring, rebuilding, rewriting, um, Doubtless gremlins have crept in in here uh, as ever the time caught up with us, and so we were kind of rushing to get the uh, the thing out the door before the final deadline with uh, you know the, the big changes in place. Uh, so it needs really more eyes on it from that respect as well. Um, yeah, so I think that you know, with this version, it's it feel and the, you know the way that it's um, is is just vastly vastly better than what we had in the past. Uh, and from my perspective, I, I think that we're, we're getting to the stage where, you know, it, it's ready to start uh, thinking about a work group last call process for it. Um, obviously, the subject to reviews, comments and everything else um, to get it there. So that's everything I've got for you on this one. Uh, any comments? 
Uh, thanks again. Uh, thanks for getting up very early for this. So, uh, uh, Suresh Krishnan. So, uh, one thing I noticed, like um, that seems wrong, is the uh, revision handling for this. So, this version is really not backward compatible with older ones. So, I think you need to bump up the revisions on the Yang modules uh, at the minimum. In the headers of the Yang modules themselves. Yeah. So, like, okay. it, and that, yeah, this is probably an example of a gremlin that's, uh, yeah, in a rush to get them out of the door. We yeah, can. so I think all the modules need to bump up because they're in like yes. 2018, 09 or something. So, I think that needs yep. to get bumped up. Uh, other that's than that, I, I think it looks good. Like, I think the cleanup, like, to limit the scope is a good idea. So, hmm. thanks. Bernie Volts, um, and do you foresee that there might be a companion document that? does the remaining options and or how do you see that sort of you know i i mean you you mentioned i haven't looked at the details but you mentioned there were some naming convention guidelines and things like that but i'm just wondering you know what you feel i mean it may be maybe it's too early to really think about it because we haven't gotten the base thing done but i think it is just a question that i have is would we likely need to do a follow-on which would define the the rest of the options that are well I, I mean it depends I, I think with with option definitions there's a bunch of simple options out there that really um you know they are exactly that they're just a dhcp option implemented by the server implemented by the client um and don't specify any additional functionality they, the, the 3319 example i have in there is uh, you know is exactly like that um and so it's it's fairly easy in that case to just say right let's just go and define all of those things and you know and, and make a module that will cover all of those um but there's also a load of options that are related to you know in some cases some fairly complicated additional server functionality or client functionality um and just having the options defined in there without having the configuration to make that stuff actually work um i'm thinking about things like um um oh, what's it called sorry it's very early in the morning uh, least, least query and stuff like that bulk least query and things you know there's an option that's defined there but what it's actually specifying is a bunch of other configurational stuff that the server would need to be able to handle um and so just defining the options necessary for least query is is not a lot of use to you if you don't have the rest of the stuff that's in there um however I think it would be possible to sort of, you know, go through the option set. And I, I mean, I've got lists that I've made of where I've attempted to do this down, to, uh, you know. Uh, so, yeah, we could do a companion document that just says, here's all the low hanging fruit. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the prefix delegate, uh, um, uh, the least query and stuff like that, it, it would need a much, much more um, detailed look at how to do it. Okay, so it sounds like there's potentially a lot more work there if we were to model. It's rest. become a big protocol, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think though that, you know, we are in a place that, or this does put us in a place whereby we've got a good, uh, you know, a solid framework that we can extend in that way. Um, you know, with, with some of these things, it just comes down to whether anyone's interested in it to, to actually be able to, uh, to want to do the work around here. Um, I think you're right, though, you know, maybe something that defined the 72, 77, you know, generic option formats, that would be useful. Um, in previous versions of the module, I think we, we've, we've tackled that anyway. So, you know, taking the thing and, and wrapping it inside um, the format that we're now uh, uh, that we're now using for options would be easy to do. Um, likewise, the older options. Yeah, I mean, all of this could be pulled together in a component in draft, no problem. Well, it may be that, you know, there'll be lots of drafts because one may cover the least query and, you know, uh, you know, there's there's the the purely sort of data options and then there's the options that add new functionality. Right. And yeah. so I think we have to look at how we would handle that, you know, because I think something like, you know, I, I mean, we could maybe bundle all the least query, you know, the the active, the bulk and stuff into one document. Maybe we'll have to figure that out at some point. Right. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, Tom Brugowski here. Uh, there's also the question whether we really need to specify all the options. I mean, some of, some of the options are protocol options, and they are generated by the server, and they are not explicitly configured. So, like, for example, you brought up the least query. So, for example, the basic least query, there is nothing really, uh, no 
option value that you have specified in the server side. This is just a configuration of you enable or disable the feature, and this is not really a DHCP option. Uh, isn't there an option in which the, the least query information is transported? I, I, it's not one that I've, I've read for many, many years, and I, I forget what the contents of it are. But I mean, the, 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 as Bernie says, you know, the, I, I think there's two kinds of options here. There's, there's ones that are just here's a, here's a format, here's a data set, and uh, you know, you implement it or you don't. Uh, and there's things that require much more back end configuration on there. And um, you know, I mean, if we can just divide the things up and then produce you know, the relevant modules for that. Uh, as I say, I mean, it's, it's labor intensive, but it's, it's, it's easy to do. Okay. Okay. Are there people willing to review this document? Well, we have, we have one hand out there. Okay, well, that's better than nothing. But, uh, you know, do take a look and send your comments uh, to the authors so that they can do these cleanups and get help with that. Um, and you know we'll we'll uh, keep working away at this. It is a it is a big challenge. I mean it is it is a big task to do this. It's not as trivial as it <laughs> it would seem. <laughs> okay, so it seems that uh, we'll wait a little bit uh, for for the review to come up. Uh, and I suppose then there will be what an, an updated uh, version a couple of weeks from now, and then we can go with last call, right? I, I would hope so. I mean, uh, two weeks sounds ambitious, but uh, you know, um, as as I say, I mean, I think you know we're, we're in a, a pretty good place with it now. So, you know, it, it's just really the final work to get it over the line. Okay. Okay, so the prefix delegating relay draft. Um, so uh, the first things first, I actually submitted the 02 version of this oh, probably about an hour ago. Um, yeah, apologies for this. The the 01 went out and um, there were there were one or two um, things that we said that we would incorporate on there based on an early review comments. Um, that were done in there, particularly the document status has now been changed to informational. It was previously standards track. Uh, that was a comment from Alexandru Petrescu, I think, um, after 00 was released. So apologies for the, the late update on there. It was just a case of trying to make sure that we had the uh, um, the things in there that we said we'd incorporate. Uh, can you go to the first slide, please? OK, so an IETF 104, um, uh, Mikhail Abrahamson did a presentation in V6 Ops about operational problems that, that we as Deutsche Telekom have seen with uh, deploying V6. And one of the things that we mentioned on there was the trouble that we've seen with um, prefix delegation with um, when you have a separated relay function. So in our particular case, and I, I think this is a reasonably common case, you have uh, your client you have a DHCP relay, which is also the first layer three hop in the network. Um, however, it is just a relay. It doesn't also implement the DHCP server function. Uh, that's a centralized function elsewhere in the network. Um, because the, the, the term delegating router, requesting router, relay, these are all kind of reserved terms and, and well understood to what they, uh, they mean and what they define. Um, we've actually taken a new term in there to decide uh, to describe this device, which we're calling a delegating relay, uh, just to differentiate it from, from other things out there. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, and just I just want to inject one thing. This is Bernie. Um, I mean, in in like a Doxis network, the delegating relay would be the CMTS, for example. And I think in in a um, BRAS network, it's the BRAS, right? The, well, the BRAS one. Is it, I, I suppose it it depends here really. 
I mean, I've seen BNG based networks that implement you know, both the relay function and the server functionality. And that's not what we're talking about here. Okay. Um, but I've seen other ones which will do a relay and, you know, will forward to a centralized server. Um, and I've certainly seen the problems in this case as well. So they would fall under what I'm calling a delegating relay here. Um, we came up with the term um, really on the basis of just you know, working the, the permutations of, uh, of relevant words here and you know, to find one that didn't already exist. Uh, although I think it, it seems descriptive of what the task is, uh, you know, the function that's being performed. Um, if there's any suggestions for a better name, then you know, I'm, I'm happy to hear those. Yeah, no, I, I wasn't trying to suggest that because CMTS does a lot more, but that's one of the functions it performs is, is acting as a delegating router. It's a delegating, a uh, delegating relay, router. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, so I mean, uh, you know, that's that's one of the things where we in the setup for the document that we describe is we, we're not interested in that particular function because, as as far as I'm aware, uh, well, actually, I've I've never really worked with those devices, but I, I don't think they have these problems because you know the, the a lot of it arises from state synchronization, and when the functions are co-located in a single device, that state synchronization is much less of a problem. Okay, so um, we've seen a bunch of problems down, down the years and these things, really there is not a major vendor's uh, piece of hardware that we haven't seen one kind of problem or another in. Um, so these range for, from um, the relay implementing logic um, about what it thinks the message flow should be and then trying to make decisions based on this logic about what should or should not be forwarded. Um, so this basically says, here's a message that I think is out of sequence, therefore I've decided that this will not get relayed. Um, we've seen cases, particularly in, in, uh, alongside that, whereby the relay will then create, it will generate a message of its own and send it back to the client. Uh, in this case, it'll say it'll come up with something like a, a no binding error code or something like this. Um, I've been through the specs, and I, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm not aware of any case where there is a valid message flow directly between the client and the relay like this. Um, but anyway, this behaviour, uh, you know, that it, it, it can't be correct because essentially what it's done is blocked any messages coming forward, um, and also this information coming from the client, uh, coming from the relay to the client, plays havoc with the client state machine as well. And so you get all kinds of un unwanted stuff at that end. Um, loss of PD state on reboot. So um, I think this is fairly well known, but if you've got a large number of clients on there and no permanent storage or no mechanism for rebuilding that table, the relay comes back up again and everything has to be rebuilt from scratch. Uh, and you're black holding traffic while that's taking place. Um, multiple PD leases is something that, that is, is very close to our heart. We've done a lot of. Um, and the way that this is handled by different devices uh, is, well, all over the place. Um, so that's something that we wanted to try and kind of bring together. Um, we've also seen some things about um, when duplicate Macs are seen between two different devices or a device is moved from one port to another. Um, and the, the behavior around what the relay does in that case is, uh, is also unpredictable. Um, so the idea with this draft was really just to say, these are the operational problems that, that we've encountered out there, um, enumerate those and provide a set of requirements that um, should enable us to solve those problems. Um, you know, one of the one of the things that we've fallen foul of is when we've discussed these problems with um, with the vendors, the uh, respective vendors, we've got nothing to point to to say this is how this is how this should be done. This is the you know the required behaviour here. So that that was really the problem that we're trying to fix with this draft. Next slide, please. So yeah, um, I mentioned about this in the intro. Uh, 8415 and 3633 before that um, both name checked the um, the architecture that I'm talking about here um, but it's very very thin on talking about how this is going to be done so this this um, this point here that's been made on um, uh, the redistribution of protocols uh, uh, instead of the routing protocol or, or whatever else um, yep yeah, that's absolutely true 
uh, but we actually declare this part of the, the, the functionality to be out of scope because you know there's many ways that this can be tackled um, and it's not really what we're interested in here. It's much more the interface between the client and the relay um, and also the relays forwarding and uh, processing of messages towards the, the server. Um, so, you know, I think there is space for this one and it's kind of, you know, an omission from uh, what 84.15 covers at the moment. Um, next slide, please. So the way that we structured this and uh, in the 02 update, um, we now have an informational draft, but we took the RFC 7084 type approach. Um, the requirements that we have in here do use 2119 uh, language. Um, but we have a description in the um, uh, well, early on in the document that kind of explains why this is done. Um, it's lifted straight from 7084, and uh, you know my, my thinking was if it was if it worked then, then hopefully it will work now. Um, we've divided the requirements into four different categories. Um, I, I don't within this presentation actually go through what each of those requirements are because. Um, you know, please read the draft for this, but we're talking about things like um, message forwarding um, and, and trying to make that as stupid as we possibly can do, i.e. if a relay gets a message, um, you know, a valid message, then it should forward it. It shouldn't, you know, try and second guess what it, uh, that should be done. Um, handling of multiple prefixes, um, permitting these things to happen, um, and also some information about lease and uh, time and maintenance. Um, that one's interesting um and we kind of there's a little bit of um i understand I although it was kind of before my involvement with the itf i understand that when prefix delegation was originally defined there were some concerns raised about the the idea that effectively what we're doing here is snooping uh that we're looking into the timers onto there and and to some extent you know i i, I don't want to write a document that says you must snoop the traffic. However, for lease and time and maintenance, I don't think there's anything else that you can do. Um, but we use deliberately loose language around this to say that the, it, it, the relay must um, synchronize its timers, must have a way of, of synchronizing the timers based on the uh, reply messages that are sent, uh, the timers in the reply messages that are sent by the server. Um, the routing, as I said, the scope for this, we keep uh, fairly low. And I think there's only three requirements that are in there. Uh, this is mainly about um, removing routes according to the timers. Um, and um, I think we've got something in there as well about, about holding the route even if the link goes down. So if you've got a link towards the client, you get a link down event, then essentially although the route cannot be active because the link is down it should not be deleted because it's still you know once that link gets re-established if the uh, if the timers haven't expired then it's still valid uh so we've got a, a, a requirement in about that uh service continuity is about really um maintaining the leases across reboots um that comes down to either having some some kind of permanent storage um or possibly implementing uh, a lease query mechanism um and um yeah, some the operational things, which are basically being able to interact with the device, uh, the, with the relay device, providing the user with an interface whereby they can check what's active there um, and and clear or you know the, them as uh, as required. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so I mean, it's it's a fairly new draft, but uh, it's not particularly uh, it's not huge in the scheme of these things. So it would be great if um, we could get some feedback on this. I'm particularly interested in um, other operators who are you know, using a similar kind of deployment topology, um, possibly other vendors, um, to see whether we have first of all captured all of the problems that are in there, um, and uh, you know, and also whether we think the uh, the requirements that we defined in there are, you know are enough to be able to cover all of these different uh, problems that people see. Um, and uh, yeah, beyond that, we'll be looking to uh, make a call for adoption in the, well, maybe after this meeting. Two winners, UNHIOL. Um, I have two comments. One is I really like this draft. 
we, you know, one of the hardest things we have finding is finding working relay agents, as weird as that's going to sound when you do interop. They do all kinds of strange things, like, you know, yep. load certain message types. It's sort of an adventure. So I, I think this will probably help the community build re useful relay agents. My only other question was the draft name is obviously prefix delegation. I mean, we see the same problems with IANAs as well. I think you should specify the stuff that matters about PD in here, but I don't know if you should change the name to just that things relay agents should do and then have a couple of extra ones to hit on the right. So, I mean, this is an interesting comment because I, I mean, many of the things, well, actually, uh, full disclosure, I really don't have any operational experience of using relays with NAs. And so if the problems are out there, I, I, I just don't know because I've never tried doing it. So, yeah, I mean, the ones I'm thinking about are those generic message ones, right? It doesn't matter what options inside of it. You know, if it's not forwarding a specific type of message, that's pretty bad. I mean, there was a, it was only a couple of them. I, I don't feel super strongly about it. It's just something to think about. Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll have a look at, uh, across that and, you know, see if there's something that we can, because it, it may be just as easy to fix it as not. Yeah. Okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Eric Klein. Um, I think section 4.1 requirement G1, a delegating router must forward messages by direction between the client and the server without changing the contents of the message. And I'm wondering, how does that comport with 60, uh, 6788, the line ID option? Because I think that gets inserted, right? It doesn't get, the, the client request doesn't get end capped and sent to a server. Or does well, it? Well, the, the relays encapsulate. Oh, it is encapsulation. So it's not yeah, actually no. modifying the contents. So, so there's no oh. modification okay. needed. And there shouldn't be. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thanks. <clears throat> I, I, this is Bernie Volson. I think that a lot of these issues also existed in, in V4 um, with just address assignment, you know, because they were, they were similar sort of problems and stuff. And I think there's also been a lot of work by the Savi working group in sort of defining how some of these intermediate devices, because they, they, the Savi stuff is, um, you know, on switches and other forwarding engines to assure that they are only, uh, you know, if they're monitoring um, <clears throat> what devices are out there and what they're, in, in their case, it's address assignment, not prefix allegation that they're dealing with. But, you know, if the, the um, device, the switch or, or router is, is monitoring the addresses a device has, they have specified that fairly well. So I would encourage you maybe to look at that and see what they have to say about some of these issues. I mean, having state in multiple places is always a bad idea because it's mm -hmm. easy for it to get out of sync. And we already have it in two places, right? We have it in the server and the client because yeah, the, I, I, has state, the client has state. Now when you throw another device in, in between there, it gets even worse. Uh, so, I, I mean, in preparation for writing this, I, I did look into the savvy stuff. And originally, when I was kind of thinking, well, what, what would the contents of the draft be? Um, you know, I, I thought, well, that, you know, the specification of the, the different state machines in the, in the way that Savvy does was what was going to be necessary here. Um, however, on looking at that and, and thinking about it, I, I, I'm not sure it's the right answer. Um, the reason being that, you know, Operationally, I think we have something that we can treat as, as being something like a black box here. You know, we, we know what we're putting in, we know what we want to get out, we know what the behavior of this thing should be. Um, Savvy kind of goes much further than this and says, this is how you're going to do all of that stuff. Uh, and I'm not sure, I mean, certainly from an operational perspective, I'm not sure I, I want to have to specify all of that. And I'm not sure it necessarily does need to be. Um, you know, what was, what was sorely missing was somewhere that I could point to with vendors and say, this is how it should behave. Um, and, and how you do that, I, I really, I'm not really that interested in. Um, I've also had a similar discussion about saying, have you implemented Savvy? Are you willing to implement Savvy? And the answer there is pretty much a no. Um, in a, you know, if, if it's not already in existence, then it's seen as something which is a pretty high overhead for implementation. Um, and, and, you know, so, so I was hoping, or I'm hoping with this case, that we can take this black box, box approach and it's going to be enough. Yeah, certainly I think maybe that's the first step is to, you know, and then if, if that doesn't succeed, maybe we, okay. have, to, <laughs> we may have to go further, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. but I mean, would, would you agree though that trying this way might be, 
you know, may be enough in the, in the first instance. Yeah, I mean, I think I actually went looking at the, uh, you know, DOCSIS specifications quickly to see, did they ever spell out, you know, all of the stuff that the CMTS has to do to, to keep up its state? And the answer is I couldn't find it. Now, maybe, hmm. you know, maybe if I look harder, I'll find it, but I did not find it. They do have a section which kind of says, you know, here's some general guidelines. And so, you know, I probably should point you to that, that I found. And it, it was kind of interesting because, you know, it even hinted that, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, in this case, it's it's home routers and stuff like that, that only will support like one PD. And so, you know, seeing multiple PDs in there is a problem and stuff. And they, they said, you know, this is hopefully something that will, will be resolved in the future that these devices will, will be more capable of dealing with multiple PDs and stuff. So it's, it's, you know, I think that's some of the things that we have to put in here is that these, if, if you're going to do this stuff, you should be, you know, you, you should be capable of handling multiple prefix allegations, whether they're in one IAPD or multiple IAPDs and stuff. Right. Uh, sorry, from, from the relays perspective, you mean? From the, yeah, from the uh, delegating relays perspective. Right. Um, I'll have to, I, I mean, I, I, I think this, I can't remember if we say this explicitly or not. I mean, we certainly talk about things like um, uh, restricting the number of prefixes that a client can support, but I can't, I, I, I think we say that it has, it supports multiples actually. Um, I don't actually have the relevant thing in front of me, but it, I, I can certainly check it. It's, it's just, I think it's just something we have to go and check to make sure that we cover that case and stuff. Um, you know, because there's also, I mean, there's another discussion that's happening in V6 ops about how the CPEs themselves need to behave, um, especially in terms of the uh, devices that are in the home or, you know, in in the uh, end network and, you know, making sure that the router advertisements are properly handled and things like that, which is mm -hmm. somewhat related to this because it's, it's, you know, how the, 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 in this case, it's really how the client from the DCP server, or you know, the client in this case here handles it. Um, but it's it's somewhat related to this whole problem of these devices are not acting uh, in the best manner to provide a good experience um, yeah. for the end user. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, is, is there a discussion on that topic? We, we... Is there what? Maybe. Is there a discussion on that topic? Um, yes, it's in it's in V six ops. Um, who is it that has the draft? Is it Fernando? No, Fernando. Yeah, uh, yeah, I read it earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's got a draft there um, that talks about the uh, CPEs. It's themselves how they handle stuff and that they need to handle it correctly. Yeah. Okay, but we don't have a topic, a, a subject um, here, discussion no. today. No, there's nothing here. Okay, um, I don't think I'll be in the V6 Ops one on Wednesday, Thursday. Yeah, I, it, we'd have to check the agenda to see when yeah, it's. Okay. Yeah, I think they have two sessions, if I remember correctly. Right, but I, I mean, given the time difference, it's uh, it requires too much rescheduling yeah, yeah. of the rest of the. Yeah. Okay. Um, so yes, yeah. Any, any other comments or you know feedback reviews? Uh, or gratefully received. Yeah, no, it's good work and I look forward to it progressing and we definitely, you know, when you feel it's ready, we should definitely, I think, do a working group call for adoption. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I have procedural question for Suresh. So this is information on the document. Is it allowed to use a normative language? I know that's uh, 7084 did that trick. Yeah, uh, so it's generally frowned upon uh, to do that. Like, uh, I don't think there's any straight up uh, prohibition for doing it, but uh, people do think it's uh, kind of an end run around the system if people if a, a draft uses it. So it's not considered fair law in general. Um, so yeah, 7084 kind of stuff like works, yeah. Yeah, 7084 does, does have a big section on how it's being used. I think, Tim, you're one of the co-authors of that, right? And I think you're uh, using it in the same way, right? You say no, I, 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 I cut cut the text from it, so yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, the, is informational the right target status for this? 
I think so, yes, but um, it could go either way, really, right? Like, but uh, it, so the the normative text is really for interoperability. So if you need it for interoperability, I would just say like you know switch to proposed standard and let's get it done, right? So that's right. Kind of what I would recommend. If but, but if it's like more about like requirement levels, not necessarily for interoperability, we can go either way. But I would really recommend like um, switching to a standard stack. Uh, but surely it's it's fundamentally an interoperability draft, isn't it? I mean, it's it's talking right. about how you interact with clients and servers that uh, you know um, probably from other vendors. So yeah, yeah. I would say switch it. Like it's earlier done than later. Like no, I don't want to do like an IETF last call and then IESG eval and then try to switch it. Right. So. Okay, uh, so we started. Off I know it's something that comes up, right? Like very frequently, even though there's like no um, written guidance, so it's a little bit flexible. But it, it, like I'm sure, like you know, you're gonna have like three discussions on just the language. Right. Uh, okay. Um, so I, I'm I'll not sure. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think it was Alexandra Petrescu who originally raised the point about the the target standards for, uh, uh, status for this, but I can't recall what his rationale was for it. Um, is is Alexandra in the room? No, I don't think so. No, okay. Um, okay, I'll, I think I'll go back to Alexandra on the uh, on the mailing list then, and uh, and just make the uh, you know update him on this discussion. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Right. Thanks. Okay. So Ian, uh, just a comment. Uh, so I looked at uh, seventy eighty four, and uh, there's the section that only looks like you know the usual reference to 2019. It says that. Unlike other IETF documents, uh, the keywords must, must not, and so on, uh, in this document are not used as, des as described in 129. And your document says that they are uh, used as. Oh, okay, have I. Uh, need to uh, update this paragraph. Well, uh, well, look, I mean, if we're going to take it back to, um, you know, in the, in the 03 update, then if we're going to go back to standards track on there, then hopefully it's a non issue. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I think that's everything from me this morning. All right, well, thank you, and thank you for getting up early. <laughs> Thanks. Hi, I'm Tim Winters, I'm UNHIRL. I'm going to talk a little bit today about advancing um, the DHBV6 standard to an internet standard or full standard. Uh, the DHCP charter has a third item in it that is about issuing an update to the DHCP base specification after so much time to advance it to an internet standard, and that's what this is about. So a couple things, just housekeeping stuff. This is all from RFC 6410. Um, there are really four bullet points under there, two independent interoperable implementations. In this case, right, that spec actually has three different types of Right, it's got a server relay, which we just talked about on a client, so we'd have to find several implementations for all of those. Um, no errata to the specification, no unused features in the specification, and uh, no IPR on any of the things in it. So currently, 8415, there's no erratas on it yet, and there's no, it doesn't update anything. It's not been updated by anything at this point. So it doesn't have any of those, and it doesn't have any um, IPR on it yet. So all of those are checked boxes for all of those features, which leaves us with uh, a couple of to-do items. Demonstrate interoperability of two clients and servers, and I messed this up, there should be relays on there too, comma, comma relays. So we gotta find a couple of different implementations, which I'll talk about some ideas we have in a next slide about that. And then we need to confirm all the features in 8415 um, are useful and nothing should be removed. We went through some of this when we went from, when we merged 3315 and 3633, we removed some of the features. I think there's a couple more we should probably talk about as a group before we move it over. Um, so the first, to solve the first problem, um, the UNHI well would like to host a virtual plug fest for DHCP people who are interested in doing this. I say virtual, you know, the advantage of being part of a university is we have a lot of students who wanna learn things. So we were thinking about taking a week um, in particular um, we're looking at the week of spring break. Nothing says spring break like DHCP v6. <laughs> um, a lot of our students work the whole week that week, so it would be a good week for us to do it. So um, we say virtual because a lot of the plug fest we do, we require people to be on site. We don't think this one is gonna require people to be there on site. Obviously, if a 
group of people want to come on site and they all want to work through the issue, we'd be more than happy to have them there. But in this case, we, we were thinking virtual. Um, we're going to do it for free in this case because we think, you know, we want the students to gain the experience. We can get our hands on the individual clients, servers, relay agents, um, all of those things. Uh, whatever test plan we come up with, we're going to use as the basis for the V6 Ready one that'll come out. There currently is a V6 Ready one for the older specs. We have to update it. So we would use whatever we find from this and ship it off to the Ready Logo Committee um, as an extra. Anything we find that doesn't work, obviously we would report back to the DHCP group saying, hey, we found these features work fine. These things didn't work so well, um, stuff like that. In particular, we would really focus around the updates between the old stuff and the new stuff. I, I think there's old stuff from 3315 that might not work, but I don't think that'll be as interesting as the update stuff that didn't make it through. Um, also during the plug fest, we'll see if there's any features that no one has implemented at all. We would report back any of that. If we don't see any support in any of the implementations for certain things, we would report those back. Um, this is a more generic question about that. So unused features. Um, you know, is there anything that's in the spec that anyone's aware of that, you know, isn't used? The one, in, you know, I, I put IATA here. This comes up all the time. I don't know if people find it useful. We should remove it. Should we just leave it in there? Um, I, I think now would be the time to discuss it again. If people want to talk about it. Okay, so the original reason why we kept IATA is to make it easier for other implementations to... Right to claim uh, compliance with this. I think it's uh, marked as deprecated, so the new implementations don't have to implement this. Right, I, my thing is, I don't, I, I've not seen in all of our tests, and I've never seen a client ask for one. Uh, Bernie Volts, I thought Windows clients at, I don't, they may not today, but they did at one point. I think they did at one point. Uh, my last survey of them, I did not see any, but I will say, I'm, I, you know, maybe there's bits you can twiddle to make that happen. It doesn't do it by default for sure. I don't, I don't know if there's something in the registry or some configuration you can turn it on that, that I won't comp to. But I, you know, I, we haven't seen any at the lab, but that doesn't mean they don't exist. I just, I'm just not aware of any deployments that are heavily using those. Yeah. And, and to remove a feature, we'd have to republish the document. Uh, yes. Yes. If we removed, yes, you have to republish it, I guess. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Um, we will post all the stuff about the virtual blood fest. You know, the main thing we want, we'll have a registration page for people to be able to register to, but we really want people's code. <laughs> However we can get it, whether it's on a VM, on a Docker, whatever it is, if you can get us code for your DHCP implementation that's doing 8415. Um, we have lots of eager students who would love to work with that stuff. So um, we'll, I'll keep the DHCP list updated with the details of it. Uh, Bernie Vols, when, when do you think the... Uh... IPv6 ready logo stuff will be. I knew you were going to ask me this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think if I had to guess, I would guess May. They do their major releases in November and May. Okay. So my guess is we would be aiming for a May time frame. I haven't talked to the other labs about this, but I, I don't think it'll be a problem since we have a background. It's not like we're making something new. So I think this is just updating right, the old stuff. Changing. Yeah, so I, I don't think this will be a major problem. Thank you for uh, doing the, yep. you know, volunteering to do the plug fest. I think that's cool. And that should help us greatly. So. Suresh, do you have any comments about the process when there's uh, anything more we have to do or any uh, red herrings you see? Yeah, so, Krishna, so I really hope we don't have to remove this. So it's like an easier process that way. Uh, so uh, there is a status change process that we have in place. Like I kind of got it down pat because I got rid of IPv5 and v7 and so on. Uh, so I know like how to do this process. Like and <laughs> Eric is here, so if he gets on next, then <laughs> he has to do that too. But I think that's an easier process than doing the document through the whole uh, last call process, right? Because everything opens up. So you cannot just say, I'm ITF last calling this change, right? Like you, the whole document comes up, so people are gonna come up with things. So I. I I think really like, you know, if like, you know, uh, some implementation implements this, I would just keep it and then go on, right? Even if it's like not widely used, if it's at least implemented, uh, we have a case to just keep it and, and move on, right? 
and I don't think it's like significantly different from IANA to like have like too much extra code like just hanging around there for that. Um, so I, I would just say like you know go for the standard status change process if possible. And uh, March is like iffy, right? Because it could be either in my term or the next JD's term. So like uh, we have to figure out like you know how the reports come out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So that uh, brings us to the end of the agenda. I think, um, you know, just as a quick summary, uh, the problem statement draft, we're gonna, you're gonna change the title. Um, I think you wanna leave the, the name, you know, the document ID itself the same, um, you know, the, the draft title, or not the title, but the draft name, I guess is the way to say it. Um, leave that the same and once that's done and if there's any other comments that you've received or whatever uh, we can you know hopefully initiate a working group last call for that document um, the yang model we need uh, reviewers um, as Ian requested so anybody that can please do so um, for the um, DCP v6 prefix delegation stuff uh, Ian was going to look at the uh, 2119 language stuff, and um, maybe there's a few edits that he's got uh, to do still, and then hopefully we can do a working group call for adoption. Um, and for the advancing 8415, we're going to, um, <clears throat> you know, look out for the Plugfest information, the virtual Plugfest, and hopefully people will submit the uh, their implementation so that we can get sufficient coverage in that testing, you know, they, they, uh, I mean, they, they really should be 8415 implementations, not like 3315, 3633 implementations. So that's one of the key things that I think we have to uh, make sure that they adhere to that. I, you know, I don't know if there's any, I mean, that may be something we want to think about. Is there any sort of tests to sort of confirm that, you know, other than somebody saying it, you know, maybe something about the 70 RC 7550, uh, handling of multiple. Uh, yeah, the, the the main one we're going to mess around with. It's really easy to tell is the T1 and T2 timers, because you have to match them up. Yes. Yeah. So that's the, the, the that'll give it away really really quick. Yeah, that uh, yeah that's a good one. Yes, that one is a good one. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, thanks everybody. Uh, anybody have any last comments? Okay. Oh. Uh, Francis Dupont. So we got a discussion uh, about a uh, feature in uh, DCP inform uh, response. Uh, there was an expert draft which uh, wants to clarify what to should put in uh, in the response. Uh, for instance, to copy uh, the client address when uh, from the inform to the acknowledge um, a packet. Uh, it seems a good idea because uh, the CPV4 specification it's uh, silent about uh, this. And uh, it seems uh, at least uh, some people uh, believe it's, uh, it was a good idea. Uh, the problem is the draft was the expired uh, in, uh, I believe, in, uh, in 12, so uh, seven years ago. I don't know why it, it was uh, expired. Yeah, so I. This is this really predates me uh, before I joined DHC, but my understanding is that uh, the major driving force behind this was David Hankins, and uh, he changed jobs, and so basically the draft died. Hmm. Yeah. So I don't know what to do. Perhaps we should discuss about it in uh, in the meeting in guest. <laughs> well, I guess. If, if you want to pick up the draft and can try to continue it, that would be a, something to do. You know, we probably have to, you uh -huh. know, 
we'd have to go through the working group adoption call again and stuff like that because it is, uh, you know, kind of a long dead document now. So, you know, you might, you might want if you want to pick it up and you think it's useful and important work, you or, know, we can take a look at it. Uh, we should discuss or maybe not. Uh, Suresh, would it be okay? I mean, the 06 expired in 20, uh, 2012. Uh, I, I personally don't mind like just revving the draft like and, and try to, because like at working group last call, you're going to find out, but it's up to you, like where you're going to find out if there's support for it or not, right? Mm -hmm. And um, if it's something simple, like might be like just filing an errata might be like a thing mm -hmm. saying, hey, this is like some kind of clarification on the original doc and then we can go from there too. But um, e either way, like I I'm, I'm okay. Like I don't want to like put too much uh, process here. So if you can just rev it and add like Francis as the editor and, and keep moving, I'm okay. Okay, so this is like... He uh, wants to be the editor, but yeah. Okay, so this, this is like uh, three pages of the actual text. So it's pretty short. It's like three or And I assume you also have no uh, issue with us adopting the um, the uh, prefix um, delegating relay work. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. And uh, hopefully everybody signed the blue sheets. If you haven't, please do. I don't know where they are right now. I mean, one is up here, but I think we just used one. Where is the blue sheet? Does somebody have it? Oh, okay. Yeah. What's that? Well, we... One of the issues...